We are back at it, and we are still on the Apostle Paul, okay? This is going to be 2 Samuel 3, 6, and 7. This is the book of 2 Samuel chapter 3, verse 6. And it came to pass, while there was war between the house of Saul and the house of David, that Abner made himself strong for the house of Saul. Okay, so the house of Saul and the house of David is two religions, okay? The house of Saul, we know who is the house of Saul. The house of Saul is Saul, the apostle Paul, okay? Now we want to go into 2 Samuel 3, 7. And Saul had a concubine, whose name was Rizpah, the daughter of Aya. And Ishbosheth said to Abner, Wherefore hast thou gone in unto my father's concubine? Okay, so Saul, okay, had a concubine. Now, King Saul is who they're speaking of. But this is going into the Apostle Paul. He has a church. He has a church. And he is the founder of Christianity. All these churches all over the world. They say Christ Jesus, okay? They say all different type of names. Guess who they all report to? They report to the Apostle Paul, all right? And Abner is being checked by his bullshit. He's like, man, why you got my daddy concubine? Why you got my daddy's concubine? And think about it. Abner was the captain of Saul's army. And here he is messing with his king's concubine. Messing with his king's church. Okay? Because the apostle Paul makes it seem like Jesus is king. He's messing with the king's church in his own words. But it's not Jesus' church. Because Jesus said, this is my father's house. For thine is the kingdom. Now I want to keep going and I want to show you from scripture how the apostle Paul had a situation in his church where he was being mocked. Because a person came in that was an Israelite having his own father's wife. Something that the Gentiles didn't do. Let's get that in 1 Corinthians 5.1. It's the book of 1 Corinthians chapter 5 verse 1. It is reported commonly that there is fornication among you. And such fornication as is not so much as named among the Gentiles, that one should have his father's wife. This proves how wicked Israel was and is. Okay? One was sleeping with his father's wife in the church. Okay? The Gentiles, they didn't even do things like this. But you got to understand the history of Israel. We started off on incest. We have so many situations of incest. We can't even name them on two hands. Okay. There's multiple cases of incest in Israel. Starting from the beginning. Now one has his father's wife. What God is doing. God is mocking the apostle Paul. Because if the head is sick. The body is sick. If you have a head of the school who is a bishop and he is off, guess what? That whole school is going to be off, all right? So God is mocking the Apostle Paul because he is the one with the Father's church. He stole God's church and he's hiding behind Jesus. Saying things about Jesus that's not true. Saying Jesus was crucified. Saying Jesus is king. Saying Jesus is the Son of God. All this nonsense comes from the Apostle Paul. Now let's look at the penalties in God's law. If you have your father's wife. Let's get that in Leviticus 18 verse 8. This is the book of Leviticus chapter 18 verse 8. The nakedness of thy father's wife shall thou not uncover. It is thy father's nakedness. I want you to go to Deuteronomy 27 20 now. This is the book of Deuteronomy chapter 27 verse 20. Cursed be he that lieth with his father's wife, because he uncovereth his father's skirt, and all the people shall say, Amen. Amen. So this is a precept number two. Let's go to another. Let's go to Deuteronomy 22, 30. This is the book of Deuteronomy, chapter 22, verse 30. A man shall not take his father's wife, nor discover his father's skirt. That's three precepts. Can we keep going? Let's get Leviticus 20, 11. This is the book of Leviticus, chapter 20, verse 11. And the man that lieth with his father's wife hath uncovered his father's nakedness. Both of them shall surely be put to death. 
their blood shall be upon them. Okay, so we have four precepts coming from the scripture God wrote with his own finger, coming from the Torah. How God is so vehemently against a son messing with his father's wife. How much of a big deal when a man is messing with his king's wife? He's messing with his king's wife. And Abner was showing his power, okay? Because if Ishbosheth was king and Abner was sleeping with his father's wife, everybody was going to be looking at Abner like he is the king. This is an ancient custom that the Israelites did. Reuben did this thing, okay? The beginning of Israel's might, speaking of Jacob, the patriarch, okay? His own son slept with his wife, okay? This is something Israel is accustomed to doing. All right, so now we established that. Now we want to move on to Ishbosheth. Now, Ishbosheth, he was a type of Jesus Christ in the fact that he was innocent. He was an innocent man. He was being played, okay? Abner elected him as king. He elected him as king, but really he was the king in the background. Now we're about to find out the awful act they did to Ishbosheth. This is going to be 2 Samuel 4 and 7. This is the book of 2 Samuel chapter 4 verse 7. For when they came into the house, he lay on his bed in his bedchamber, and they smote him and slew him and beheaded him and took his head and got them away through the plain all night. Okay, so Rechah and Banna, these were children of Benjamin. They killed the man while he was sleeping. They killed the man while he was sleeping. They were so afraid of the house of David getting stronger and stronger. And they was getting weaker and weaker. So they came up with a plan. It was like, let's just cut Ishbosheth's head off and take it to David. All right. And join Judah. But let's keep going. And they brought the head of Ishbosheth unto David to Hebron and said to the king, Behold the head of Ishbosheth, the son of Saul, thine enemy, which sought thy life. And the Lord hath avenged my lord, the king, this day of Saul, and of his seed. And of his what? And of his seed. And of his seed, okay? This is going into the apostle Paul, formerly named Saul. And you're going to find out why did they cut his head off? What is that going into? But let's keep going. And David answered Rahab and Benah, his brother, the sons of Rimmon, the Berothite, and said unto them, As the Lord liveth, who had redeemed my soul out of all adversity. Keep going. When one told me, saying, Behold, Saul is dead, thinking to have brought good tidings. Okay, so we have an apostle preaching that Jesus is dead. That is false, okay? That is totally false, okay? Now, I want to bring out a Bible character by the name of Mephibosheth. He is from the house of Saul. He is from the tribe of Benjamin, okay? And this man represents men that were abused by the Apostle Paul's teachings, okay? Not just the women were abused, but also the men, okay? The teachings of Paul has not only abused the women, but it has crippled the men. This is going to be 2 Samuel 4 and 4. And Jonathan, Saul's son, had a son that was lame of his feet. He was five years old when the tidings came of Saul and Jonathan out of Jezreel. So let's find out how he became lame. All right. And his nurse took him and fled. And it came to pass as she made haste to flee that he failed and became lame. Now, what caused this man's fall? It was the news that he heard. So the news or the good news has caused this man to become crippled. There are many Mephibosheths today who are lame. They are unable to produce fruit. They're unable to bear good works to the Most High. It's because they have been crippled. Okay, they've been made lame by the teachings of Paul, teaching that Jesus is the Son of God, teaching that Jesus is God, teaching that Jesus was crucified. All of these teachings, communion, all these teachings about multiple wives that Paul forbade, all these things, the Apostle Paul is at the root of those issues. 
the good news is really just bad news. Although that is going into something else, you're going to see how all this connects. Because I keep telling you, Ishbosheth is a type of Christ, okay? Now let's keep going. When one told me, saying, Behold, Saul is dead, thinking to have brought good tidings. Thinking that was good news. Keep going. I took hold of him and slew him in Ziklag who thought that I would have given him a reward for his tidings. Okay, so the good news, you notice that the gospel is called good news. All right, good news, good news. And supposedly, the good news is that Jesus died for your sins. That is a bunch of baloney, all right? Now I want you to keep going into verse 11. How much more when wicked men have slain a righteous person? A righteous person. Ishbosheth was a righteous person because Jesus is a righteous person. And if he could say any words to the Apostle Paul, it would be the same words Ishbosheth said when he said, Why do you have my father's concubine? Why do you have my father's wife? That's my father's wife. That's your king's wife. Okay? He would say the same thing to the Apostle Paul. Why do you have my father's church? Why do you have my father's concubine? All right. Now I want you to finish where you at. In his own house, upon his bed. Upon his bed. We're going to come back to that bed. Shall I not therefore now require his blood of your hand and take you away from the earth? Keep going. And David commanded his young men. And they slew them and cut off their hands and their feet. Cut off their hands and their feet. That's going into this huge line about Jesus having piercings in his hands and in his feet. Okay, keep going. And hang them up over the pool of in Hebron. Okay, keep going. But they took the head of Ishbosheth and buried it in the sepulcher of Abner in Hebron. Why? Because that was his head. Abner was Ishbosheth's head. Okay? But it was the flip side of the coin. The head of Ishbosheth in the same sepulcher with Abner. Now, who told us that the head of every man is Christ? Paul. The Apostle Paul, okay? The Apostle Paul has a stolen church, supposedly headed by Jesus, but he is the head of it. He is the founder of Christianity. And just like Ishbosheth's head, was in the sepulcher with Abner, it is the same thing with the Apostle Paul because Jesus Christ is his head. Now, the ceremony that they had when Abner elected Ishbosheth king is totally false because the prophecies was that David would be king from Dan to Beersheba. Now, we know that this is speaking of the Gentile messenger, okay? This is speaking of the prophet Muhammad. Peace and blessings be upon him. This is speaking of him having the kingdom, all right? The kingdom was taken from Israel, and it was given to a Gentile fruitful nation, which only makes sense to be Ishmael. But the apostle Paul, here he is, hiding behind Jesus. All these churches that got Jesus' name on it, they're not Jesus' churches at all. It's a big fraud. And just like Abner was using Ishbosheth, the Apostle Paul is doing the same thing with Jesus. He is using him, all right? He's setting him on high so he can hide behind him, okay? Now we need to get back to where we was at. Paul told us that the head of every man is Christ. Let me get that. Matter of fact, I want to see who knows where that's at because that's easy. I'm going to let you get that. 1 Corinthians 11.3. Trying to give her a shot. Yeah. There you go. Let's get that. He said the head of every man is Christ. That don't even sound right now that I'm in the truth. Okay? Because Abraham's head was God. <laughs> David's head was God. All the patriarchs of the past, heads was God's. How come a man, somebody God created, is now our head? Let's get that scripture. This is the book of 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 3. But I would have you know that the head of every man is Christ, and the head of the woman is the man, and the head of Christ is God. Paul was teaching that baloney. I'm going to show you another scripture he said that. Let's get that in Ephesians 4.15. It's on the screen. 
Does the book of Ephesians chapter 4 verse 15, but speaking the truth in love, may grow up into him in all things, which is the head, even Christ. There you go, we have it again. He said it again. Let's get that in Ephesians 5.23. This is the book of Ephesians chapter 5 verse 23. For the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church, and he is the savior of the body. Okay, so the apostle Paul, the apostle Paul brought that garbage erroneous teaching. The Apostle Paul brought that teaching, okay? I'm going to show you another one where he says that in Colossians, okay? This is a good one. He is still talking about Christ being the head. And this is going to be Colossians chapter 2, verse 19. This is the book of Colossians chapter 2, verse 19. And not holding the head. Not holding what? The head. He's speaking about Christ. Keep going. And not holding the head. From which all the body by joints and bands having nourishment, ministered, and knit together, increases with the increase of God. The Apostle Paul came with that garbage, okay? Talking about Christ is the head of every creature, okay? So that head had to be cut off. God had to allow that head to be cut off. Now I want to show you some more interesting things about the Apostle Paul, all right? Let's go to him casting people in prison. This is going to be the book of Acts, chapter 22, verse 4. This is the book of Acts, chapter 22, verse 4. And I persecuted this way unto the death, binding and delivering into prisons both men and women. He was putting people in prison. Paul was putting people in prison. Everyone that called upon the name, he was putting them in prison, okay? And this is what the Bible says, okay? It says they was calling upon the name, and we know that means Jesus, of course. But however we interpret it, he was binding up all those that called upon his name. Now let's get that in Acts chapter 9, verse 14. This is the book of Acts chapter 9, verse 14. And here he had authority from the chief priests to bind all that call on thy name. He had paperwork from the chief priests. Okay, from the southern kingdom, whom Jesus called devils, to bind all that call upon his name. Now let's get that in Acts 21, 11 real quick. Now is his turn to be bound up. Let's get that. This is the book of Acts chapter 21, verse 11. And when he, had, and when he was coming to us, he took Paul's girdle and bound his own hands and feet and said, Thus saith the Holy Ghost. Okay, now that girdle is going into his belt. All right, now I want to show you a scripture where the Apostle Paul tells us that the belt represents truth. This is the book of Ephesians chapter 6 verse 14. Stand therefore, having your loins girt about with truth. Having your loins girt about with truth. That's all I need right there. That's all I need. Having your loins, your girdle, girded about with truth. Now let's get back to where we was at. And said, thus saith the Holy Ghost. So shall the Jews at Jerusalem bind the man that owneth this girdle and shall deliver him into the hands of the Gentiles. All right, so this same man that's being bound up right now, the Apostle Paul, now he is going to be bound up. I want another precept in the book of Acts saying that chains and afflictions is awaiting Paul. This is going to be the book of Acts chapter 20 verse 23. This is the book of Acts, chapter 20, verse 23. Say that the Holy Ghost witnesseth in every city, saying that bonds and afflictions abide me. Saying that bonds, bonds is going into what? Chains. Chains are waiting for you, Paul. A prison is waiting for you, Paul. Now I want to show you some interesting facts, okay? You're going to find out what Paul called himself. This is going to be the book of Philemon. All right. It's on the screen. I'm just going to run through them real quick. This is the book of Philemon, 123. There salute thee, Epaphras, my fellow prisoner. Philemon 1.9. I'm just going to skip to the bottom part. And now also a prisoner of Jesus Christ. This is Philemon 1.1. 1, 1. Paul. A prisoner of Jesus Christ. 2 Timothy 1.8 
Be not thou therefore ashamed of the testimony of our Lord, nor of me, his prisoner. Okay? The Apostle Paul is constantly calling himself a prisoner of the Lord. Now I'm going to read this Hadith, okay? This is a Hadith, all right? It's not the Quran, but it is a Hadith, okay? And it is an authentic Hadith. It's going to be Hadith 26, verse 80. And it's in book 37. First, I want to read this first. The name Paul in Arabic is Ulas, the founder of Christianity. Did you know there is a prison in hell called Bulas according to this Hadith? The proud will be gathered on the day of judgment, resembling tiny particles in the image of men. They will be covered with humiliation everywhere. They will be dragged into a prison in hell called Bulas, submerged in the fire of fires, drinking the drippings of the people of the fire, filled with derangement. Now that's deep, okay? One thing you'll learn is that the Apostle Paul never talked about hell. He's got about 13 letters. The book of Hebrews is unknown, but most people attribute the book of Hebrews to Paul, and he never talks about hell. Jesus, his teachings, he talked about hell constantly. Now I want to talk about his mission, okay? The apostle Paul was sent to the Gentiles, and before he joined the church, he was in the wilderness. Now Jesus gave us a warning of one coming out of the wilderness. This is going to be the book of Matthew, chapter 24, verse 26. It's on the screen. This is the book of Matthew, chapter 24, verse 26. Wherefore, if they shall say unto you, Behold, he is in the desert. He is in the desert. Another word for desert is what? Wilderness. Wilderness. Perfect, perfect. Arabia is mostly a wilderness. Okay? It is surrounded by desert land. He was in the wilderness. And I'm going to prove that. I want you to read what's on the screen right here where it says Paul was in Arabia. Paul was in Arabia, including Damascus and the surrounding desert, for at least three years immediately after his conversion. All right. He was in the desert. Now, I want you to read the New American Standard Bible. And this is Matthew 24, 26. So if they say to you, behold, he is in the wilderness. He is in where? In the wilderness. All right, Jesus is talking. Look what Jesus says. Do not go out, or behold, he is in the inner rooms. Do not believe him. All right, now let's get the scripture in the same chapter where Jesus talks about false Christ. He talks about false Christ. This is going to be verse 24. This is the book of Matthew, chapter 24, verse 24. For there shall arise false Christ. False what? False Christ. Keep going. And false prophets. Keep going. And shall shew great signs and wonders. And so much that if it were possible, they shall deceive the very elect. They're going to deceive the very elect. How could they deceive the very elect? They're in the church. They're in the church right now. Okay? That's how great the signs that this false prophet or this false Christ would show. It would deceive the very elect if it were possible, okay? Now, let's go to Mark 13, 22. This is the book of Mark, chapter 13, verse 22. For false Christs and false prophets shall rise and shall show signs and wonders to seduce, if it were possible, even the elect. Even the elect. We have a traitor inside the church, okay? Hiding behind the name of Jesus, hiding behind this lie that Jesus is the Son of God, that He is King, and that He is the Lord, okay? He's hiding behind of all of that, okay? But really, He is the founder of the Christian church. Really, He is the King of the Christian church, just like Abner, when he had his king's wife. Now, I want to show you a scripture in Galatians chapter 3 where the Apostle Paul is trying to make people 
believe that Jesus was crucified when they did not believe it. All right. This is going to be Galatians chapter three, verse one. Paul has a tent peg and he is literally trying to kill somebody with the cross. Let's get that. There's a book of Galatians chapter three, verse one. O foolish Galatians who have bewitched you that you should not obey the truth before whose eyes Jesus Christ has been evidently set forth. Crucify among you. All right, so he's trying to make people believe Jesus Christ was crucified. All right? He's pushing this tempe in their skull. He's trying to make them believe that Jesus Christ was crucified. As it is written, jail. She was Herber's wife, okay? She was a Canaanite. And she was killing a man inside of a tent with a tent peg. Now, I'm going to get that scripture for you. That way you can understand. This is the first time temples is even mentioned in the Bible. It is in Judges 4.21. Then Jael, Herber's wife, took a nail of the tent and took a hammer in her hand and went softly unto him and smote the nail into his temples. And this is what the Apostle Paul is doing inside the churches today. This is what Paul is doing in the church. He's killing the churches with the nails. Okay, he's been preaching that Jesus Christ has been crucified, that he has nails in his hands and in his feet. This all comes from the Apostle Paul. Okay, all of the Gospels was shaped by his letters because we got the letters of the Apostle Paul first. Jail. She was killing Sisera with the tent peg. The Apostle Paul is killing the church with the cross. Believe it or not, but it is true. He is killing the church with the cross softly. All right, this is war without bloodshed. Your boy jail. Paul was a jailer, wasn't he? All right, he was binding up all those that called upon the name. All right, and he is doing the same thing in your church today. Wake up. Now I want to keep going. I want to get some more scriptures on Paul being in the wilderness. Now let's go to the book of Acts 21, 38. This is the book of Acts chapter 21, verse 38. Are not thou that Egyptian, which before these days made us an uproar? And led us out into the wilderness 4,000 men that were murderers? All right, so Paul is being accused of something. We don't know if it's true or if it's not, okay? All we know is that he was right about him being in the wilderness. And he said, ain't you that dude that was in the wilderness with those murderers? And we know the apostle Paul killed the church and bound them up. Now I want to show you another scripture of Paul being in the wilderness from his own mouth. This is going to be Galatians chapter 1, verses 7 and 8. I need somebody to get that in their own Bibles. Jesus warned us of one that will come out of the wilderness doing signs and doing miracles okay let's get that this is the book of galatians chapter 1 verse 7 which is not another but there be some that trouble you and would pervert the gospel of christ mm -hmm. but though we or an angel from heaven preach any other gospel unto you than that which we have preached unto you let him be a curse all right so he's pronouncing a curse on anyone receiving a revelation from an angel and he's in Arabia I wonder who he's trying to talk about now I want you to go to Galatians chapter 1 verse 17 this is the book of Galatians chapter 1 verse 17 neither went I up to Jerusalem to them which were apostles before me but I went into Arabia he said he went into Arabia because he was in the wilderness of Arabia keep going and returned again unto Damascus all right now I want you to go to Acts 26 19 and 20 this is the book of Acts, chapter 26, verse 19. For that reason, King Agrippa, I did not approve this obedience to the heavenly vision. All right, because he said he had a heavenly vision, although his story was mixed up. Okay, and one chapter he's saying people heard a voice, and in another chapter he's saying people didn't hear a voice. Keep going. I did not prove this obedience to the heavenly vision, but continually proclaimed to those in Damascus first, and in Jerusalem, and then all the region of Judea. And even to the Gentiles, that they are to repent and turn to God, performing deeds consistent with repentance. All right. So we hear that he said with his own mouth, he's given his testimony, how he was in Damascus because he was in Arabia. 
So now we're going to close, but I want us to go to the Gospel of Barnabas, okay? Which is not in your Bibles, but it's on the screen. This is going to be Book 215, and I'm going to read. When the soldiers with Judas drew near to the place where Jesus was, Jesus heard the approach of many people. Wherefore, in fear, he withdrew into the house, and the eleven were sleeping. All right. The disciples were sleeping and Judas was coming in with the soldiers to get Jesus. Then God, seeing the danger of his servant, commanded Gabriel, Michael, Raphael and Uriel, his ministers, to take Jesus out of the world. The holy angels came and took Jesus out by the window that looked up toward the south. They bear him and placed him in the third heaven in the company of angels, blessing God forevermore. So I just wanted to show you another gospel, okay? Not everybody believed the accounts of Paul, okay? Not everybody believes the accounts of Paul. And I have some amazing precepts speaking on this same subject in the gospels about how the men were on the roof and they let down a bed to be healed, and Jesus told them they had good faith. So we're going to finish this. It's time for us to get in these scripts, shall we? We shall.